welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It's nine o'clock, which means it's time for a talk magic. And I'm here today with a legend in the magic community. And he really is. I've followed this guy's career for a very long time. And he is one of the ent most entertaining magicians I have ever met and a really successful person as well. It is, of course, the one and only Paul Romhani. How are you? Thank you. First of all, I want to congratulate you on getting my name correct. I was stressing about it the entire way through. I'm like, I'm, I'm <clears throat> gotta get this right. <laughs> I've been, I've been, in, <laughs> you know, I've been. <laughs> Sorry, I laugh because uh, I, every time I go on stage, if someone has to do it and they don't know me, but that you can see they want to get it right, so they're like, you can see them, and this happens on cruise ships all the time. Ramhani, you can see them go, Ramhani, 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 and the minute they have to do it, they go, ladies and gentlemen, Paul, blah, 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 blah. it's completely different. <clears throat> Doesn't bother me anymore. I don't care. Well, you know what? Thank you for coming on the channel. I mean, you are one of the busiest people I know. It's 7.30 in the morning over where you are. Um, and you've been up since four editing and doing work, which is just insane. And, and now you've jumped on this. So thank you so much, Paul. It means a lot. It really does. I'm going back to bed after this. <laughs> no, I'm not. I blame you. I blame you. <laughs> that was one of those days where I had to, uh, we've got a special edition coming out on Jim Steinmeier. Hopefully today I should have finished it. And uh, I, I just wanted to get it done. So you just, you know, you got to get up and do it. You got to do what you got to do, right? Absolutely. You, know, you do a lot of things. So people probably said, "How do you do it?" Or "How do you have a family? You know, raise a kid and 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 and, and do the magic and the two businesses." I never. You don't think about it, right? You just do it. You just do it. It's that things need to be done, and you just kind of. It's not an option to not do it. So no. yeah, I completely agree with you. But so it's the same. Same with me. It's just you just do it. That's my motto. Just do it. <laughs> that's the thing you know people say that I'm busy but you've got so much going on and I want to talk about it all but you've you know we we talked about our mutual friend David Penn earlier on and one thing, I don't know, <laughs> some guy some guy but one thing David's done throughout his career is he's reinvented himself over and over again and and you've done the same thing you you are a true entrepreneur in magic because for you you've done so much uh, and, and the perfect example is what you've been doing recently with, with Vanish Magazine, I say recently for the last decade, but even mm -hmm. before that, you've, you've done so much and you're always coming up with a new angle on things and coming up with different ways of, 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 of approaching magic as a business. And it's really inspirational. It really is. Thanks. Um, um, I think I just get bored a lot. <laughs> um, no, uh, you know, um, coming from New Zealand, growing up, you had to do everything and I don't know what it was like in the UK. Uh, I think in the States, you could probably, you could specialize. You know, there were close up guys that just did close up. And in New Zealand, you really had to do, and it's pretty, I think it's still a same that, you know, you had to do kids' parties. You had to do, um, if someone said, can you do illusions? You go, oh, I can do it. Oh, yeah, I have, I can do illusions. <laughs> you have to go and scramble to build an illusion. Um, <clears throat> um, television, you know, uh, it's such a small country that you really had to do it all to survive. And so I think a lot of it comes from that. So I got a lot of experience. I started working in DOS. The first book I did was Wayne Rogers. Uh, and he was my mentor growing up in New Zealand. But I started working with a black screen and just numbers <clears throat> and DOS writing his book. And from there, I was hooked, you know, and um, but uh, um, reinventing yourself. I think I was about. I might have gone to a business conference or something or read something and somebody said, you know, things, I don't know how old I was, I must have been in my early 20s and um, things were getting kind of stale. I wasn't quite finding my, myself as a performer. And somebody said, you need to reinvent yourself. And that was the best uh, best advice I ever got because I, that's when I started doing um, uh, keynote speaking and I started researching uh, humour in the workplace and I would go into hospitals, uh, police stations, uh, fire halls, and looking at how people in different jobs used humor. And so I became the corporate speaker and I, my, my, what was, and then and the pay increased too. We just start doing, as you know, public speaking, you're not a magician anymore. It's not the bottom of the ladder. You're now a public speaker who in people's minds, here's a successful person, here's, you know, this is what you get for your money. Um, uh, 
what, oh, anthropologist. That's what I reinvented myself and I build myself as a anthropologist, which is a word I made up. Uh, and that's what I was. I was a person that knew all about fun and could teach people how to have fun. <clears throat> and that was a real change. But that's that's where the re I learned way back uh, 30, 30 something years ago about reinventing yourself. And, it, and it's worked. Mind you, you've seen if you've seen my shows, you know, I have to keep reinventing myself because they're crap. <laughs> Uh, they're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's start at the very beginning. Let's rewind a little bit, first of all. Obviously, uh, you, you're from New Zealand, grew up in New Zealand. When did you get into magic? Like, when? when what, what was your origin story, Paul? Um, I'm an identical twin, and my brother actually lives in the UK. He's been here for about 20 years. So we, well, maybe longer, actually, now. We, we did everything together. Uh, he was more into sports, and my thing was magic. So I was about eight years old, maybe a little bit younger, when I first saw my very first magician, there were two guys I saw. One was Rain Rogers, who I always talk about, and uh, he passed away, but Wayne's all around me. I mean, this is Wayne's illusion. And I used to go in this when I was a kid and, or a teenager in the system, and it's a Harbin's barrel illusion. And, um, and I inherited it before he passed away. So Wayne was a huge influence. So he was, and I remember him doing the zigzag. I must have been about eight. And I never forget this as long as I live. I remember going to the show and he did the zigzag and he said, now I'm going to hypnotize everybody. And I really thought that we were all hypnotized so that we could see this lady in the three parts. It was terrific. So Wayne was a huge influence um, and he was my next door neighbor. So he um, took me under his wing, would give me magic books. I would go to every gig to help him. In fact, his chair suspension is right over here. I would help him with his chair suspension. Uh, there was the time I, I, I was giving him the chair and these chair suspension chairs, the Harbin chair suspensions are really heavy. And I smashed his fingers <laughs> and he had to perform his smashed fingers. Because when, when, even I smashed my fingers just putting them away. They're horrible things. Um, they're so heavy. So, so it goes way back then. And I was doing, I also stopped, my brother and I did music and he teaches in London now. He's been there for years teaching music. Uh, so music was my a really big part of my life um, back then too. So, you know, and then, and then another magician I saw about the same time, um, Welsh magician living in New Zealand, also passed away, Peter Evans. He, um, he did a, my granddad was having an outdoor barbecue and he and, and got Peter and his wife down to do some magic. And he did, the, um, he did the wrist chopper and they were looking for somebody to do the wrist chopper on it from the audience. And everyone goes, Paul, he'll do it, he'll do it. I was a young kid. I was so scared that I actually ran away. <laughs> I had to go looking for me because I didn't want my wrist chopped off. <laughs> I hated that trick. <laughs> I still hate that trick. It's a terrible trick. Um, <laughs> it's crap. Um, so, yeah, it goes way back to when I was a kid and I saw, saw these magicians. And then um, growing up in New Zealand, it's quite different because there weren't too many of us. And so I was like the young kid on the scene and everybody took me under their wings. I think everyone, you know, they could see the passion in me. And when I was about 18, um, I got the chance to tour with Chuck Jones, Ricky Dunn, Marvin Roy, all these super celebrities, people that I would read about in magazines. And I was, had a, I didn't even have an act. They just felt sorry for, for me. And, um, but the thing I learned about it was been on the road for years with these incredible acts. We toured Australia and New Zealand. So from about 18 to in my 20s, uh, they never looked down upon me, even though I realized I was way out of my league. I mean, even today I'm out of my league if I had to go on stage with, if they were around, you know, Mr. Electric. And, um, but they, they never, they always treated me with respect, like I was one of them. And I'll never forget that. Like, you know, there was no judging. They offered help, the suggestions. And the best advice I was given was by another good friend, a mentor, Alan Watson. <clears throat> and Alan said to me before I went on tour, he said, now listen, he said, if you, if you want to learn from these guys, don't show them one trick on the road. Because you know, when you're young and you're starting out in magic, you want to show everyone everything um, and prove how good you are. Um, so I never, I never showed them a trick. I, I was practicing in the hotel room with the cards, and, but never around these guys. And one day Ricky turned to me and said, you know, kid, I like you. I said, oh, thank you. Why? And he said, because you haven't showed us one damn card trick. Because <laughs> when you're on the road and with these people that have been doing it all their lives and who have done everything, I mean, there was nothing they hadn't done. Um, I think they just wanted to talk, talk and share stories. And so they really opened up to me. 
and were able to, uh, they shared all these incredible stories. I learned so much from these guys. So, so that kind of explains it in a nutshell. Has it been an hour yet already? My how time drags. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fascinating. I mean, talk about being thrust into the spotlight at young age. Oh, it was horrible. Oh, it was horrible. I ended up in hospital on that tour. Uh, also, I, I've been to that hospital on several tours. Um, chicken pox, I think I got on tour once. <laughs> but but um, yeah, th those tours were, you know, you'd be traveling. Uh, you just don't get that experience. You can't get it from a book. You can't get it from, you only can get, get it from doing gigs. And I think the best advice is, is just to do as many gigs as you can. And early on, I was doing everything. As I said, in New Zealand, you had to do everything. That's incredible. And, and talking about doing everything, like people know you now primarily as a stage performer. A lot of the things that are synonymous with your name are stage pieces. Mm. But I mean, back in the day, you were doing a lot of close-up as well. And, and kids. Oh, yeah, I still, I, I still do. I, oh, yeah, I still, oh, I love close up. I still do lots of close up, actually. In fact, I often do close up as Charlie Chaplin. <clears throat> and I developed the whole technique of performing without talking. So think of every trick you do close up, but you're not allowed to speak. And it really heightens the magic. Mm. I discovered something I was doing, and I see a lot of magicians doing is that if you have a card, for example, and then you do a double lift, whatever you do a card trick and you say, now turn over the card. And you've just told them what you've taken away the surprise you've told them and they know that their card's going to change. And so they turn it, Oh, it's changed. But as chaplain, I don't say anything. I might nod. I just, I wait a bit. I stand back, wait, and I'll do that. And I go, what? And then the, so the reaction is stronger because there's no words. So I discovered the power of silence uh, when performing, especially close up. Mm -hmm. And I've never really talked about it. A few people I've talked about it, um, but it's nothing I've talked about really, but it, it's such a powerful thing. And it's a great exercise. Imagine if you can do a whole act in silence. So that's the other thing is that once I discovered Chaplin, I, I discovered Chaplin, by the way, when I was about eight years old, I, I saw a movie, The Kid, so I always had a, a fascination with Charlie Chaplin. In fact, I won a, a, a dress up competition as Chaplin. I think I forget how old it was as a kid. <clears throat> um, but I'll, I'll get into that too, how that came about. But so the, the close up, I love close up magic. I still do close up magic. In fact, just prior to the pandemic uh, last year, was it last year? How many years have we been in this lockdown? I think six. Yeah, um, months, yeah. <laughs> something like it was that. like six years. Um, uh, I was working, I, I was booked to do, I was just about to take on, it was supposed to start actually as lockdown happened here in Canada, um, an eight month contract with my own theater in a really high end resort about half, uh, 45 minutes drive from here. And, um, but I, I was, I was, I was going to do close up and then I was good. They, they were actually going to build me a stage and a, they had a ballroom. They were going to deck the whole thing out. I was going to have a projector. Um, uh, but during the lockdown, they phoned up and said, look, you know, it's all off. I said, no, I understand. I, don't, I knew it would be. Um, last year, last summer, as things kind of opened up a little bit, they got me back to do some social distancing close-up magic during lockdown with a mask on. Mm -hmm. um, it was an interesting experience. Uh, but I still love close-up. Close-up, I think, is, I love it. I'm doing, I'm surrounded by close-up magic. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got a couple of questions for you before we move on, because I'd like to talk about Chaplin. But first of all, mm. do you have any, I mean, you've performed on some of the biggest stages around the world. Do you have any advice on managing nerves when walking out on stage? Oh, question I knew you were going to ask this. Well, it's a question I get all the time on the channel, because there's a lot of close-up guys that want to take that leap to stage shows. Mm. But there's a world of difference between performing to three people in a group and walking out on stage in front of a few hundred people cold where they don't know you. And you've mastered the art of that. I just wondered if you had any. Very, there's a couple of points there. Um, first of all, the idea of, of anyone going on stage and, you know, you've got to, you only have seconds to get whatever it is you have, your personality across to the audience, right? Um, you know, you'll, you'll turn up to a gig, now the comedian's on. Well, please, okay, and the audience is sitting there, okay, Mr. Funny Bones, make me laugh, you know, with their arms folded. You've, you've only, you've got how you look, everything, the minute you walk out. 
Uh, it's interesting because things change drastically. There are, there's a Jekyll and Hyde to my performances. There's Paul, me, who's just me on stage. And then there's Chaplin, who's, who's Chaplin as far as the audience is concerned. And <clears throat> imagine you go to see, um, I always, I used to tell people this uh, as an example, you, you know, because I remember seeing Steve Martin and imagine you go to see Steve Martin on stage or, or no, who's the other guy, the English comedian? Um, well, there's lots of them. Um, Ricky Gervais or, or, or I was thinking actually Tommy Cooper. So let's talk about Tommy Cooper. Before you even go to Tommy, see Tommy, you in your mind, you're laughing sitting in a chair because you know what Tommy, you know, it's Tommy Cooper. He's just, he has nothing to, he doesn't have to come out and prove anything. If there's a great story where he's off stage, probably drinking, but with a microphone, 15 minutes, just laughing into the microphone and the audience is on the floor crying because it's Tommy Cooper. Now, if you did that, they'd go, oh, he's drunk. <laughs> they'd walk out. Um, yep. <clears throat> so, so there's the celebrity. So with Charlie Chaplin, it was interesting because the minute I became Chaplin, I, I, and I really do remember this, I had no, it was a completely different vibe. I walked out, people in their mind go, oh, it's Charlie Chaplin, <laughs> you know? It, it was completely different Other than Paul coming out. So oh, it's Paul Ramhani. Okay, funny boy, make me laugh. It's two completely different things. So I have the experience of both. Now, obviously I'm not Charlie Chaplin. I'm not that, that delusional. <laughs> Some people that do imp uh, impersonate people are that delusional. I've worked with them. They think they are that person. Um, <laughs> but um, so there's, so I have those, that experience. <clears throat> so with Chaplin, there's not one ounce of nerve in me. I'm not nervous. I know the character. You have to understand, I've been doing it for 30, 40, 50, you know, 30, 30 something, you know, a long time, 30 something years. Um, so there's, I can be talking to you like this and, and I, I do it all the time. I'm talking like this to you before I go on stage. Um, often I might have a little glass of port or something. Um, but before I go on stage and then I'll say, uh, uh, please, uh, Paul Ramhani is Charlie Chaplin. And I'll say, oh, I better go. And then, but the minute I hit that stage, I'm Chaplin. Um, I'm, there's no, and people go, I, like I've been with people, they go, shouldn't you, uh, you know, be prepping and um, shouldn't you be, I go, no, I mean, if I'm not prepped now, it's too late. <laughs> it's like, <clears throat> I was, I did a thing, this, I was it two years ago, just before lockdown or whatever it was, and there was another entertainer there, and, and um, this person said, um, you know, setting up, and, and, and in the morning they're setting up, and, and I'm really relaxed and carefree about the whole thing, because I know what I'm doing, I've been doing it for 30 something years, and they're like, Sh and, and, and shouldn't you be getting into character, and so I go, no. No, <laughs> they couldn't. I think they were offended by my attitude that I wasn't taking it seriously enough. Um, I don't care. I, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I mean, um, everything that's gone wrong in that act has gone wrong uh, over the years. I've performed in every venue. There's no venue you can put me in that I can't do that act. Underwater. I've never done it underwater. That's about the only thing I can think of. <laughs> uh, now I'm going to get a phone call to do it underwater. <clears throat> um, but other than that, I, I've done it standing on a chair. I, you name it, on the back of a truck, whatever, I've done it. Um, so the character is so ingrained within me, the performance is so ingrained, I, there's no room for nerves. I actually really enjoy doing it. In fact, I enjoy doing Chaplin more than anything else because <clears throat> I'm in my own little world. I go on stage, I do my act, I connect with the audience. I don't say one word. I go off stage, take my makeup off. Nobody bothers me. Nobody, I could walk out of the theater and I don't talk to anybody. That's how, that's how I am. <laughs> on cruise ships, it was perfect because I'd be at a group of table with magicians. People would come over uh, and, and they'd say, oh, da, 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 da. oh you, you were that, you were the, you're the comedian, you're the singer. Uh, and they look at me, don't know you. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> so that's great, leave me alone. Um, so so the, the no nerves in that. In the other show, um, not really nerves because I enjoy it. I just enjoy it. Um, and I've been doing it for so long. People say, if you don't get nervous, you can't do a good show. Um, I don't, for me, it, it's never been the case. I, I get it that people are nervous. So I'm probably the worst person to ask for advice. The only advice, I, and the only reason I say that is because I, I've, before, I've been doing it for so long and everything's gone wrong that's gone wrong. I'm so, I have backup plans for everything. So I look at every situation. And if something goes wrong, I'm, and also your attitude, how's your attitude? My attitude is stuff happens, it goes wrong. If you make a big deal about it, <clears throat> then people are gonna remember the big deal. You know, I, I've been playing piano since I was six, six years old. And one of the things I learned as a piano player is that if you make a mistake and you stop, 
the audience goes, oh, he's made a mistake. Oh. <laughs> um, but if you make a mistake, you just carry on as though nothing happens. Chances are most of them aren't going to notice it. And so that's what I brought into my performance too. That's really good advice. And the thing I'm taking from that is flight time. You know, just... And that's, that's really at the end, of, that's really the best advice anyone, I don't care what people say, the only advice people need is, is well, they need a lot, I don't know if they need advice, I'm the worst person to ask for advice, but, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, every time someone asks for advice, I keep saying, oh, the worst, because I, a couple, quite a few years ago, I was, I just quickly, this is a funny story, a uh, young guy asked me for advice, he's about to go on to a magic competition, <clears throat> and I was just hanging out, I was a guest, I can't remember, I oh, know I was, I was, at the convention as a performer, I think. He said, oh, I'm about to go do this competition. What, what advice, his dad was with him, what advice can you give him? And I, I'd hate that because I'm on the spot. I'm going, okay, well, I'll just go out and do what you do. Do what you do. I didn't know what, you know. And he went out, but I didn't realize that what he does is he's a comedy performer who works very blue. And um, it was the wrong type of audience. Had I known his act, my advice would have been, well, you know, you, if you want to win the competition, tailor your show to your audience, which is what I would do naturally anyway. You know, <clears throat> if I want to get a return gig and I went to went to work a gig where, you know, you couldn't swear or you had to watch your language or whatever, um, I, I would watch, I wouldn't, you know, I'd take note of that and work towards my audience. But uh, I gave him the wrong piece of advice. <laughs> he lost. He actually walked off stage. He was so uh, so angry with the audience. And I, I felt responsible. So from that point on, I say to people, don't ask me for advice. I'm not the right person. Um, but anyway. Well, you've, you've alluded to Chaplin quite a lot. And for those people that haven't followed your career as closely as me, let's talk about that. What, how, so, you, you know, you've been a full-time magician your whole life. You were going on tour with legends at 18 years old. You've done absolutely every type of magic imaginable. When was it that you had the idea of creating this Charlie Chaplin stage act? Obviously, you're a fan of Chaplin at the age of eight, you've told us, mm. but when did that translate into, you know what, I'm actually going to do this on stage? It was about the age of 18. I did. What happened was um, uh, Marvin Roy, Mr. Electric, came to New Zealand on a tour, his, one of his first tours, and he did a lecture, No Magic, and it was on character development, how to, how to do a themed act. And he did an example, and I saw him his lecture notes, and I recommend it to everybody, but he did a themed act. He, he threw out a, a some, he asked people to throw in suggestions like, and somebody said cookie or biscuit, I forget what they called in, in, in the UK, cookie or a biscuit, you know. Um, and so he developed a whole act of everything you can do. He broke it down into productions, vanishes, multiplications. And he pretty much, if you want to do a, an act of a biscuit or cookie, um, he had developed, he had worked out an act for you on, on using his theories. And so what he said was, he said, take something that you really enjoy you're passionate about or that you know you like could be a hobby or something you know if you're into sports maybe you're into rugby do a rugby act or a golf act or something you know a themed act and and my thing was chaplain and pretty much that night or the next day i went home i, I found a mustache whatever and i thought holy smokes i've got an act this is it this is it and that moment it was a light bulb go a light bulb that's that's funny um well, it's funny for me it was a light bulb going off but that's mr electric right um <laughs> bad pun um he you know that that was the inspiration was was that idea of of um i wanted to create an act and from that moment on i think like the next week this is true story the next week i think or prior to that i was doing a clown show full white face clown a local casino had hired me to do a, a white face clown and I developed a character for them, but um, where I would do strolling magic at a casino and the casino was a clown. But the next week they hired me, I thought, bugger, I'm not doing the clown anymore. Um, I, from that next week I was doing Chaplin. <laughs> so, and I hadn't stopped doing it. And what I discovered was, because the act was silent, I started getting work in Singapore for months, several months a year, into Dubai. Uh, I started traveling a lot and in cruise ships and in other gigs wow. around the world too. Wow, that's incredible. Do you find, I mean, you talked about characterization. Have you got any advice? Because obviously you've got, you, you sometimes go out as, as Paul. You sometimes yeah. go out as, as, as Charlie Chaplin. You've got the two acts. And it's a little bit like I interviewed on this channel recently, Mark Spellman. Mm -hmm. And he yeah. comes in a very similar situation because he gets booked as Mark Spellman, yeah. but he also gets booked as X. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. About how it's a completely different thing. So 
is it the same with you? What, how, I suppose the question I've got is, can you give any advice on characterization? And also, does the character that you're portraying affect the tricks that you put into your act? Like, is there something that you would have your Chaplin act do that Paul would never do? Great question. Pretty much everything in chap, not so much that Paul wouldn't do, it just doesn't fit me. Um, Chaplin has taken 30 years to really, and it's still in development. I mean, I'm still working on it, it's still in development. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. So the best advice, which is the hardest advice, which everyone gives, so it's so, so cliche, and I remember getting this advice as a kid and I didn't know, I didn't know how to do it, was just be yourself, which is funny when you think I'm doing Chaplin, well, that's not me, when in fact, it's more me than me. <clears throat> and I'll try and explain this. Um, so, the, so the advice is, you know, you have to be yourself. So you, we, and growing up, I was everyone but myself. I was, I remember being Paul, influenced by Paul Daniels because we had Paul Daniels on that show every week on te television. Uh, I went through my David Copperfield phase. I went, and my friends, my older friends here um, can tell you because they remember, you know, oh, you're yeah, taking a bit of Paul Daniels or, you know, Copperfield or, or, or Harry Anderson. I used to wear a hat and um, <clears throat> they would make funny, you know, they would just make little comments and they'd say, you know, you're going to be more successful when you're actually yourself. But I didn't know who I was. You have to know, the, the biggest thing is to find out who you are. How do you do that? I don't know. I think it's it's maturity and some people some people know who they are. They're very fortunate at a young age. I didn't, maybe I was just immature and um, maturity just as I got older, I realized, you know, who I was and that's who I am on stage. Uh, so I know my character on stage very well. Uh, Chaplin, so I was studying Chaplin. I still study, I have books and techniques and <clears throat> read, watch films and look at techniques. So that's very much ingrained in me and that's spilled over into my real life. I'm quite Chaplin-esque without trying to be Chaplin-esque, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm always, Chaplin had a very different way of looking at things. In fact, a suggestion is, is for people to watch the black and white movies, Chaplin or Keaton or, uh, Laura, uh, well, Laurel and Hardy, but Keaton, um, Chaplin, all those guys, because they were able to, they, 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 you could see in their performances, and especially the longer movies of Chaplin. When we think of Chaplin, we often think of a short movie, but actually his best work was the longer films. And so he would take you on a journey where you would, they would you could, in a Chaplin movie, you could cry, laugh, be angry, all that stuff. You get all these emotions within an hour and a half. And it's like, whoa, you went on a journey. And I always say with magic, you should go on a journey as well. But um, I studied the character development with Chaplin, uh, sorry, through Chaplin. And I guess the more I was Chaplin, the more I realized how much actually a lot of those things are actually me. And so, I, so when, pe when people ask me about character development and I say, well, you have to be yourself, they go, well, you're somebody else. <laughs> I don't know, what they don't understand is that when I am Chaplin, actually very much, that's really, I think, who I am, you know, quite, um, that's, that's really who I am. So there's a lot of that in me. That's really good. I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure if I answered your question because it's a really hard question to answer. No, you I mean, did. Because it's the cliche thing about um, you have to be yourself. You have to know who you are. Now I know we, you know, when you go on stage, you, you know, we're talking like this now, um, and my level from here to performance is a is a more excitable performance. My joy, I don't usually do seven thirty in the morning gigs. Well, I'm half asleep, but um, but obviously there's a bit more. There's a you know there's a, I know that it's like a it's like a kid almost a um, uh, little cheeky little. I'm a cheeky little Kiwi, and when I work cruise ships, because I'm working cruise ships with old people mostly because they're chaplain, um, or as we say, dead and resurrected, um, <laughs> the average age of the audience on those world cruises. But <clears throat> I know enough to know that that I can be their cheeky little grandson from, you know, that cheeky little kid from New Zealand. Now, I'm not rude or anything. I'm not cheeky as in um, uh, rude, um, but just my, you know, they want to take your cheek and go like this sort of thing. You know, they think, oh, he's cute, you know, cute, you know that sort of thing. So, um, and the, so that's the character and that's kind of who I am anyway. So it's not, it's not that many steps above who I am. 
But would you would you adapt your character based on your audience? So when you found yourself on cruise, uh, cruises where you've got primarily an older audience, did your act change in order no, to endear it? No, not at all? No, not really. That's when I realised that this was my audience. <laughs> Old people. <laughs> it was perfect. No, not, no I didn't because... Um, um, because that's why it fitted so well, I think, because, uh, um, you know, here's the thing, when I was younger, I was, you know, in my 20s and things, I was doing corporate work, and it was terrible, I, I hated it, I really felt un uneasy, because I was doing gigs for CEOs or people in their 40s and 50s, and way out of my league, you know, uh, not my league, but I couldn't relate to them, that's the thing, I couldn't relate to my audience, and so... <clears throat> I, I was doing g g gags that uh, that just didn't fit. You know, those stock gags that are just horrible. I was doing all those gags and um, they were just, they're just awkward. And I felt awkward doing them. And so I stopped, I just thought, well, hey, what am I doing? I just stopped doing them because they were just, uh, uh, you can't be a young kid doing those horrible gags to older people. It's just disrespectful and it's not mm. funny. This is not funny. Um, uh, you know, the older, uh, what's his name? Oh, that guy was funny. Um, Rickles, Don Rickles, the older Don Rickles got, the funnier he got, because he just didn't, it just didn't care, and he got away with it, so so it's interesting as you get older, your your views and things change, you know mm. um, you can see, I think you can get away with a bit more as you get older when you're young, I think you have to be a little bit careful of of how smart you think you are, or how smart your character is mm. Mm. Yeah. I think, yeah. I might be wrong probably am yeah. <laughs> well, you're doing everything right you know you're doing everything right on that subject I wanted to, I want to ask you another thing one thing that you've got a, an innate ability to do and I've seen you do it over and over again and I could reel off a list of examples a mile long but I'll give you one specific example you have an ability to take a trick or a prop that everybody has used forever and completely turn it on its head and make it something completely different and unique and the perfect example i'll give you is your multiplying buffaloes routine which mm. from the second oh, I've, I've updated it now you should see it now well no, i've got it here oh it's somewhere but yeah sorry it's <laughs> been in my act for yeah. over a decade uh you do it like yeah. the, with the, mm. the, the, and there's a perfect example though paul because this is something everybody whoever did the multiplying bottles did it exactly the same way and then you were like well, hang on, let's do it. You took an existing established prop, completely changed it. And you've done that over and over again. I have. Um, yeah, yeah uh, it, it, it um, comes from boredom, I guess. Well, no, no, it doesn't actually. Not, uh, I've been on cruise ships too long. It comes from creativity, whether it be with a magazine or, or performing um, I, or creativity. I, I don't have the other side of the brain, which is technical. It's all creative. I think it's just one big blob of creativity rather than I can't, I'm technically a hopeless. Um, uh, but the, I love creating. So that's why I love the magazine so much. Cause I, I just, it's a, it's a channel to create. And so when it comes to magic and, I, and especially with Chaplin, I, I looked at things and with, I think we, we you, you asked a question before I probably didn't answer it, but um, with creating magic, um, and especially for Chaplin, you know the character so well that you know within, I know within a few seconds of what music will fit it, will fit the character. It comes partly from my background in music, but also knowing the character, I could look at a, a hundred magic tricks and within a few seconds go, no, 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 no. Um, very, very, really, very, really do I buy a trick for the Chaplin show. Um, very rarely because nothing fits nothing's made for that show or the character right they're made for some other character um you could possibly turn them around but i don't want to invest all that time when i can probably create something myself i'd rather invest that time and money into creating my own thing mm -hmm. so that's unique to me or the character or the show um <clears throat> uh so when it, when it come what was the question <laughs> Um, when it comes to <laughs> going off track, sorry. That's okay. When it when it comes to creating, um, uh, or, or yeah, I look at things and I think, well, how can I? It's not so much that I. How can I change that? How can I make it suit me better? An example. Now, funny you see the multiplying bottles. Um, I've been working on. Uh, you know, I've been doing that from 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 a very early age. The bottles. 
Um, and even, even now, there you can't see, but I was going to show you, but down here is a, the new edition, where at the end, now look, actually, let me grab, hold on, I think you should see this. Um, okay, hold on. See. So <clears throat> now, oh, hang on, where's it gone? You can probably see it from the frame. Oh, gosh. <laughs> So, so I have a whole set of, of the um, rum bottles. Mm -hmm. And you, I don't know if you're familiar, there's a famous song, Rum and Coca-Cola. So I start off, I'm thinking of doing this as Chaplin, it'd be quite funny, but if, or, or even just Paul. It's one of those tricks that can actually be done as both. Actually, there is, there, you, you said before, there are the only tricks that, that, do, that I do both as Paul and I said, no, well, actually I lied. This is one, the multiplying bottles, but I, they're both different performances of the same trick. Mm. <clears throat> um, I might do the version that, that I sell uh, that we talk that you're talking about for Chaplin because it's a audio thing. I don't have to speak. He follows the instructions. But for Paul, I might do this. But anyway, so I have a whole set of rum bottles and uh, so rum and Coca Cola. So they've got the glass of Coke, just the glass, and you do the whole thing, change places, all these bottles. And at the end, the glasses vanish and they become cans of Coke. Oh, that's amazing. But the method is even better. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm working on, this is something I'm going to market actually. It's, uh, I think I'm going to, I've, I've got, I've had the prototypes made. I used to make them myself out of cardboard, but they look, they look crap. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but these new ones are terrific. And so um, I've been developing this. So, so now both glasses actually vanish and there's to be a straw coming out of them, um, vanish and you'll be left with uh, no, no, um, no, no glasses, just cans of Coke, or it could be some cans of whatever, you know. So, um, so yeah. So I'm constantly, even though, even though I've been doing that for over thirty years, um, I still, still think. I think you never stop thinking. I never stop thinking about even the floating broom in my act. In fact, I was talking to, I think it was Mike Caveney. We were. Who was us? Yeah, I think it was Mike. And and Mike's Caveney's. Yeah, I think it's Mike. It's Mike. Yeah, and his amazing books. He has phenomenal books. Where it's just beautiful. Um, one of the things I said to him when I was talking to him, I noticed that he's the same. You know, take his famous chicken uh, knife through coat routine, where he produces a chicken. You can see the stages where it started, and even to today, he never gave up thinking about the best method, or mm. the best. You know, to and you think after thirty years, you'd, you'd go to think well why would you waste your time no you, you don't if you really are passionate about your act you never stop thinking about it um and that's how it improves and so it, the the, the chaplain act never be finished uh, mm. because it, i'll never be happy with it and i think it's part of the reason that it's constantly growing little nuances i'll put in little nuance nobody else will recognize except me but i'll know i've, I've updated it or changed it um so <clears throat> creativity it comes from from a need of of and I joked earlier about boredom. I guess I'd get bored just doing this, you know, the store board instructions. Mm. Um, 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 so I, uh, yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's there's a need to, for me to do it, but mostly because I just enjoy the creative process of it too. Well, talking about creativity, let's talk about you because you released a lot of magic. Uh, over the years. Yes, I remember, I remember a review you did on my Linking Hearts taking the piss out of me. <laughs> I don't remember oh, that. No, no, you were so right, though. It was, oh, yeah, no, I don't put you on the spot, but it was funny. You really? loved the trick. Oh, no, no, but I agree 100%. Because <laughs> I, I had to film, I was in I, I was in transit at the time, and the trick was released, and um, I had worked it all out, we'd made it a lot, and I was performing it, but I was doing it as chaplain. Um, so, but I had to do it as I had to, I had to do it for a video, for a tutorial, and I didn't have a routine talking. And, and I just played, I thought I'd do it like this. I couldn't do it as Chaplin, so I don't like to sell a chat that, that, that thing, it doesn't work for anybody. So, I did, but I never, never figured, but you gave it a great review, but you did say, now, I just wish Paul, or you and David both, um, I've got the linking heart up there. You said, I hope he, well, he stopped doing this. I forget what I was doing with my, oh, that's, I was banging against my heart for some reason. So, <laughs> I never forgot, always made me laugh. I thought well, they, were, they were bang on with that because I felt awkward doing it, but I left it on the video. Sounds <laughs> 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 like the sort of thing that I do, to be honest. Sounds like me. Yeah, that sounds about right. Sound like you at all. But I, I will give you credit, I'm not going to give you credit, but um, I, will, I will say this for another review you did, and I couldn't believe it, absolutely couldn't believe it. 
um, you reviewed the, the 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 appearing disc illusion. I built one of them. I've well, still got it. I've still I got it in my warehouse. I, I'm thinking, okay, the guy's going to review the, but, and even David was surprised, I think, on your, on your review channel, you guys used to do. Um, <laughs> you actually built the illusion. And, 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 and I thought, well, who the heck builds an illusion for, for a review? So I was really impressed. That, 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 um, <clears throat> that was fun. I really enjoyed building that thing. I built another one, but we never reviewed it. Didn't you bring out a dollhouse production or something? No, that wasn't me. Um, that was Wayne Rogers. He built, he, uh, it was a truck. Yeah, I built that. Oh, you built it. Oh, that is terrific. I've got one. I've got his original one too. And uh, there's a few that Paul, Paul Daniels built it too. Um, and I, I assume he used it. Um, now that was, I did bring it out, but it was Wayne Rogers um, creation. I just put it through my, you know, he and I released it. So, yeah. It's amazing. It's still in my warehouse with all my other illusions. It's incredible. But I remember the first time I saw you lecture. It was at the South Tyneside Convention. Holy smokes. That was my first ever lecture ever. Really? That's the very first time I saw you. I was at the South Tyneside Convention. I kind of forget like, that. I, I didn't, and I was, I was watching you. I was like, oh my God, this is like an amazing lecture. And it was, it was incredible. Thank you. I think I bought everything you had back then. Um, you want your money back? No, no, not. <laughs> I suppose my question is, what made you decide to start releasing products? Because- Oh, it's quite easy. <laughs> Sorry, carry on. No, the, the reason I'm saying is, I'm pretty sure it wasn't for money because you're you you oh, it's never for money you know yeah, exactly like you 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 were and still are a really highly in demand performer whether it be corporates or 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 on um, ships or whatever it may be you are never short of work and and then all of a sudden you start releasing magic and lecturing and hmm. and, and and why i suppose is the question. oh well because i see now a couple of things one i started writing I had a passion for writing early on as a, as a teenager. Um, <clears throat> but when I started doing cruise ships, there was way too much, it was all downtime. I mean, you know, you'd be on stage an hour, took me an hour, uh, you know, to set up. So a, on a week, I might be working three or four hours, maybe, you know, and the rest of it was downtime. And I would look at other people on ships and they were either drinking or getting into some sort of mischief and just didn't, it just didn't, what wasn't who I was. I just didn't care for that. Um, um, so I thought, well, I, either, either I will end up like a lot of the other people who are drunk or, or I will use my time valuably. And I, and I had all this time. So I just wrote and then I, and I, I wrote a book. I started, I thought, oh, I started releasing things. And then, um, what and I really got into it um, because I could see cr the cruise industry changing big time. I could see it, and I thought, you know, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. A lot of people I know spent forty years on ships, and that's it. And 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 especially when they got off ships during the pandemic, that's when people learned. Well, wait a minute, I have nothing else. If you if they had their own show somewhere, well, I have nothing else. Nothing else to fall on, you know. And, and you can see it on Facebook, on the comments, they're, they're depressed, There's, they're, their life is over, they're, they're nothing, they, that's all they have, that's all they put into. So I thought, well, early on, I thought, you know, you should you not put your eggs into one basket. So I started creating, I started writing, um, releasing, and, I, and the lectures allowed me to travel as well. So if I happen to be in a country with a performance, I thought, well, I can do a lecture as well. Um, certainly it's not for the money. I, any creator knows you don't do it for the money. Um, so yeah, it was just a way of sharing. And then the magazine just started because I wanted to give back. So, and then when my son was born, I, I really got into it because I didn't want to travel much at all. In fact, to get me to travel now, that's why I love this online business because it means I don't have to go anywhere. I can sit in my, sit in my office or something and, <laughs> and not travel. Um, so, so yeah, so when he was born, I really wanted to cut back and, and, um, I didn't want to be one of those people that were always away. So Hmm. Does it answer the question? It does. It answers the question brilliantly. And you kind of fast forwarded at that point to the magazine and you said, I just, I just, you know, I saw a gap in the market, but let's be honest. And for those people that don't know, you started publishing Vanishing, Vanish magazine pretty much a decade ago. Yeah, 10 years ago. Yeah. And it originally started off as just an online magazine. And now you can get printed subscription as well. Yeah, it's printed now. It's um, 
Yeah, I'm really super proud of it. it, uh, it um, it's developed into, uh, I'll grab this one because it links it into the UK audience. Um, you know, it's developed into, uh, into something really I'm super proud of. It started just because uh, I, you know, I would pick up a magazine and I would, would flick through it and there'd be nothing in there that was of interest. It was all, all the same people. Um, nobody knew, I don't know, just, you know, I wouldn't spend long on it. So I thought, well, and I've always enjoyed reading magazines. Um, and so I thought, well, if I did a magazine, what would it be? And then I got the opportunity to edit, I think two issues of a magic magazine in New Zealand, which folded, um, not, not because I edited, but, but the, the guy that was running it had a heart attack and I took over for two issues, but it gave me a chance to then uh, design it and then have it printed. And, and then um, he took, he, when he was well, he came back and a couple of years later he passed away and the magazine folded. But, um, but it gave, that was my first and I thought, wow, you know, um, oh, this is, I enjoyed doing this. There's something in this I really liked. Uh, I liked the organizing of it. I liked creating the whole thing, the, doing the layouts. I liked talking to the different people that they put me in contact with. And then, and then I thought, well, the one rule with Vanish is that, that I have always had is that it has to be something I want to read. So if only one person reads it and it's me, then that's my goal achieved. So, uh, and, and, and diversity, I wanted it to be very diverse because I felt magazines were kind of stuck. Mm. Just plateau. Um, no, I mean, magic, magic was the only one that, that really changed the game. You know, magic magazine, everyone else followed. Um, uh, and so, so I just, I started doing digital magazine. And when I first started out, it was like 600 pages each issue. It was bi-monthly and I had so much material because I realized that a lot of people felt the same way and uh, everyone jumped on board. Mm. And so it, it started out bi-monthly and then everyone kept saying, it's too big. Well, my theory was it should take two months to read. You know, um, <coughs> excuse me, and and then finally I whittled it down to whatever, whatever it is now. I just you know, I don't go try not to go over a hundred pages. Yeah, it's a hundred pages. Um, that one. Amazing. Um, so, but and I try to keep it uh, current. It has to be current. Um, diversity is the number one thing. I I really do make an effort for it to be as diverse and so I choose you know you could look at any one magazine and then you've got people on it that you may never have heard of or you don't know about um, um, or, you know from Spain from the States um, um, and I do double covers so that gives me a chance to feature two different performers on it mm. uh, and so on no no I haven't no. Um, sorry. Uh, so it gives me a chance to feature two different performers on it um, mm. You know, and it's just, and I, and I go, we, we look at people from all over the world. And last year was a very sad year. So many people passed away, legends passed away last year. So it gave me a chance to, I'm just trying to grab some copies so you can see, but, um, you know, Bev Bergeron, for example, um, Walter Zane Blaney. You know, so it gave me a chance to do the covers I had planned, plus, plus also uh, pay tribute, oh, hang on, sorry, pay tribute to those that had passed. Uh, so, and, and I'm, I'm always looking at ways to improve it. I'm always looking for people to contribute. Uh, oh, where from there? Um, so it's, it becomes, um, it, it really is what I want it to be and what I think a magic magazine should be. And I modeled it after, not, not Mac, funny thing is I modeled it after a Mac magazine. I didn't want to model it after any magic magazine that was out there. So I thought, cause I didn't, they didn't interest me. <clears throat> um, so actually, took the model from a Mac magazine, the Mac magazine. And I suppose the question I was going to ask, and you mentioned it there, was um, how, how can people get involved with the magazine? Let's say there's somebody that's watching this, that's trying to make a name for themselves. Their ultimate goal is to appear on the front cover of a magazine, but they've got tricks that they want to contribute or whatever it may be. Yeah. Obstacles. How can people get on your radar, Paul? Oh, just send me an email or, or Facebook or an email and uh, they can go to Vanish magazine.com and I think there's my contact on there um, and and just contact me I, I, we have people that people have never heard of in the magazine from uh, there's a guy that contributes from India 
um, that I'm sure nobody knows who he is, but he's got great magic and he contributes. Uh, the young guy from Toronto, Aaron, who's doing really incredible things. And he's in the current issues now, he's doing a, a series of online magic. And it's just, there's so much good magic out there uh, that I'm always open to um, ideas and concepts. And sometimes people send me ideas and I think it's so good that it gets its own special. Uh, I got wind that Jim Steinmeier, <clears throat> who we all know, um, had Jim Steinmeier had a book coming out. Well, I don't want to give it away. It's called The Mysterious Book That You Will Never Read. Uh, and it's a fascinating story. And I spoke to Jim in length about it and came away with this great story about it, but it was too big to put in the magazine. So now it's going to be a special edition, uh, which, which once I finish here with you, I'll probably finish off and hopefully get out but today or tomorrow, um, and it's it's terrific. And and I also look outside of magic. This is the other thing we can learn a lot from allied arts or artists. Uh, ben Robinson um, has got involved with knife throwing, uh, and we did a series on that. We did a special on the knife throwing. There's such a tie with with the skill of throwing a knife. It, it's a huge industry. Uh, it's very big and um so he we put a special out on that which is kind of which no other mag, mag magic magazine would cover because it's not magic but if you when you read it you go oh gosh this is Clyde tied closely said Clyde this is tied closely to magic and uh so my, my radar was always open to what's out there I, I don't join in Facebook much anymore I might put pictures of flowers up because I like my garden but um <laughs> or my family but I, I don't put a lot of things up, but I am lurking in the background because I'm always, and I have friends that are always out there looking for different ide and new ideas, the latest thing. So, okay, that's good. That's and it's an inter, and it, well, there's this, you know, it's an interactive magazine too, which is the beauty of it. So at any time you can go and watch videos, you can look at uh, reviews or whatever. Um, <clears throat> often the tricks, Louis Fox, for example, is a great thinker. Louis has, um, uh, often they have video with the tricks, so it, it's best of both worlds. Um, the printed version should have, and I don't know if I've got one here, they have QR codes if you want the printed version, and there's video, I'm just looking, sorry, there's, you have QR codes. That's great. So how much, how much is a subscription for online? I think it's like, a, oh yeah, online, I think it's like a dollar, I forget, it's like a dollar ninety nine or something an issue. Cheaper than a, cheaper than chips or cheaper than a cup of coffee. <laughs> and, and what about the printed? If people wanted to print it. Oh well, the printed is on demand, so it's a little bit higher than normal. Um, but they can go to they can go to because uh, we don't <clears throat> I don't mass produce these. If I mass produce thousands of them, uh, then they'd be a lot cheaper. But I don't I don't want to get into the subscriptions. Uh, we are working on a version of Vanish, which will be coming out very soon, which I think um, you, everybody will hear about. But uh, it's like a, it's it's um it's it's there's a digital and then there'll be a different version of vanish which will be printed uh but um <clears throat> right now you can go on and get all the back copies of the digital ones as printed copies on vanishmagazine.com and it says order printed copies just press that and you'll see the copies that are available and and there are also i, I did compilations of of i'm working on well with 10 years that's 10 books so i think we've done four books so far and it's like the best of each each book. Yeah, each each year the the, the the books have the best of each year in them. I've started collecting those. They're amazing. <laughs> They're really yeah, good. They're it's, awesome. It's the great yeah. material. I mean, it's like thirty best tricks and, and articles in there. It's the old expression, isn't it? If you want to hide a great trick, print it in a magazine. Like there's Absol oh, absolutely. And people don't even know about it. No, there's uh, even the old uh, the old IBM. I, I love going through. Actually, I prefer to go through the older magazines because there's so much good stuff in there that's forgotten about. Oh, for sure. So I've got two more questions for you. Um, one that I've been, I, I know I'm going to get crucified in the comments if I don't ask you this question. Um, so I'm going to ask it. Do you have any advice on getting work on cruise ships because you've spent a long time obviously you do it less these days because mm, yeah. having a family but you've spent a long time you literally could if you wanted to spend all year on cruises and just jump from one to another obviously it's been a bit COVID, <laughs> yeah. but you, yeah. you have done exactly yeah. so have you got any advice because it is a, it is like a goal for a lot of performers that they want to get in that cruise ship market and it's going to just, there's going to be, there's about to be massive changes too. In fact, it's, 
it's like taking the taking it taking the the, the business and just on a whiteboard and rubbing it clean and starting again and that's pretty much what's happened with cruising what, what's what i've found with cruising now what, what i've been told is that they want people to go up for much longer periods of time for a lot less money um so the dollar is the the wages are dropping so i know a lot of the the pros that used to do it have all got they've all gone elsewhere um mm. they've either got their own theaters but um it's it's not going to be what it used to be that's for sure uh, that life is gone that life will be gone um it's going to be, I mean, the world will be different once we can get back to some sort of travel again. Um, the best advice for cruising, I tell everyone, is make sure you are ready. Don't, you might have, I don't know, you might have one show. Uh, I can tell you right now, you're going to need more than one show. You're going to need two or three solid shows, uh, at least two solid shows. I think they're going to be wanting you to do uh, Princess Cruises, I believe, was asking people to do Walkabout Magic in the Atrium. Uh, that's when I left them because they wanted me to do Walkabout as Charlie Chaplin. And I said, well, how much extra is that? They said, no, no, nothing. I said, okay, I'll go elsewhere because <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Uh, it spoils the surprise of the show. Um, but they want people now to do lectures. They want them to do um, kids magic. They want them to do, uh, I wouldn't be surprised actually, to be honest with you. I wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me if they, if they say, okay, we want you to work an hour every night. In fact, I did actually. Uh, I did a. It was a really good pay. That was incredible. Um, best cruise money I ever got a couple of years ago. Um, I did. They they had me doing strolling magic every night, and I did my show every night. It was a different sort of cruise, but I did it for a month. Um, hated every minute of it, but I got great pay. It was terrific. Um, <clears throat> um, but I, I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they get you to do strolling magic. Uh, two. I know definitely. I've read that they want to do two shows at least. Um, two different shows, which we've always really done, but make sure you have two solid 45 minute shows. Um, and you only get, so my advice is to make sure you are ready, make sure you have good material, make sure that, um, uh, yeah, just make sure that you are ready. That's the best advice. And then, and then you know, you can get an agent. Um, I think they'll be looking, for, and, and also now there's this thing on cruise ships where you have to be a certain age. And then actually a memo went out where they wanted people under 30. Wow. Yeah, we, that memo, I think, got sent out. It went out to agents. Um, uh, now, that's not always the case. Uh, I have a friend who's, I think he's 80, and, and he's getting his contracts in, but he's a ventriloquist. I think if you're a ventriloquist, you can write your own ticket. If you're a magician, just line up like everyone else. Right, got it. You know, uh, I, I know for a fact they're, they're ventriloquists, because a ventriloquist you know, so they want to know what you're doing in your act now. They want to know social distancing. Um, uh, I was told no, which is perfect for me because I don't. I, I actually am a ventriloquist, and and somebody the other day asked me, "Would you go back out, or do you think you have the material?" I said, "Yeah, I have the material because I can go out and do my ventriloquist show, which is like a stand-up comedy show with a puppet, and I can do the Chaplin show, and I never have one person on stage." So I think they want they're looking for people with, which is really hard to do at, at two forty-five without audience interaction that's going to be really hard so um maybe it's the day of the illusionist coming back uh you know if you're going on ships for six months then you could take a few illusions on um so it's going to be a real change a real change for people um uh i think you know you've got to look at your lifestyle as well you probably aren't going to do it if you've got family so it's more of a young person's game mm. um yeah, it's going to be, it's so, I mean, I can give advice on the, on the old days, but I think it's going to be even worse now, like as far as what they require from you. Which is, and you mentioned this as an offhanded comment earlier on, but never have I heard a more truer piece of advice, which is don't throw all your eggs in one basket. Uh, I did that way, way back when I first started, when I was like probably 19, 20, something like that. I was dominating in my area, the restaurant market. I was doing like uh, probably 15 restaurants a week, every week, like right. every night in the week. And then three on a Saturday, three on a Sunday. I was killing it uh, all through the same company, uh, I, I, all through the same company. And then all of a sudden they pulled everything overnight and I was left with literally no work. And I learned at that point, you've got to, you've got to not have all your eggs in one basket and, you know, you mentioned that earlier on, but it's so important. It happens with cruise ship people because that it's like yes, and I this would happen with me, and why I wanted to get out of it was because you got so comfortable, and the act just got 
the act just got stale because you couldn't work on anything. I didn't have access to tools and workshops and other people to brainstorm off. Um, so I wanted to get out of it. And that's, uh, the, that's why it kind of, that's another reason I got out of it. I, I just, I lost the passion for going on. We traveled 124 different countries. Uh, we did it for 100, I mean, I, I've had an email to see if I was interested and I, I thought, no, I'm not really interested at all. It doesn't interest me at all. Mm. Um, if I go somewhere now, I want to go on a lecture tour where I can take my family or on a holiday, <laughs> you know, um, not, not on a cruise. Oh, if we go, we go, we were going cruising. We were just cruising ourselves prior to the lockdown because um, my wife likes cruising. I couldn't care less, but my son enjoyed it. And that's good. That's so. awesome. Well, you know what? <laughs> this has been an incredible interview, but let me ask you one last question, yep. which is what's next? Um, and what I mean by that is you've had an incredible career, Paul. If you decided to retire today, your legacy is set. I mean, you've created some of the most in-demand magic that I, uh, that, that's ever been produced. You've lectured all over the world. You've performed at a very high level your entire life. Your Chaplin Act is known everywhere. Um, you know, va va what you've created with Vanishing Ink, Vanishing Ink, different thing. What you create, that's Andy and John. <laughs> Only yeah, yeah, you know how many times I spoke to Andy about that, and he gets the same thing. He goes, "Well, you love your magazine." He goes, "No, that's not me." And people say, and "I go, no, I wish that was me. I wish I did have Vanishing Ink. <laughs> then I could retire." <laughs> well, you're slightly better looking than Josh J. You see, boy. So. Oh yeah, thanks. Yeah, right. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, you've got all of this stuff going on. You, you know, the Vanish magazine itself is 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 just, you know, it's it's epic. But you're not going to retire. I know you're not, and you're not you're not going anywhere. Can't so afford to any, retire. Do you, any, do you have any goals left on your magical bucket list? Any stuff that I, you, I, you have I, I, Yeah, no. Well, as I said, I do uh, with the magazine. I certainly do, and you'll be you'll be hearing about that soon. Um, it's a funny goal really to have. I spoke to, had a good meeting with Stan Allen about that goal. And uh, I sent him an email saying, this is what I'm gonna do. And he he said, we need to talk. <laughs> and I thought, oh dear, he wants, I know what he's gonna say. And he phoned me up. And once I told him exactly what I wanted to do, um, he was, he said, oh, okay, you can do it. <laughs> um, he's a guy, I wanted to put it through. I knew he was gonna <laughs> try and talk me out of it. Um, but I wanted to explain to him that the con so I do have something planned uh, for Vanish. Um, I'm very excited. It's super exciting. It's going to be quite different. It's uh, I like to think outside the box. I'm always looking ahead as well. So so once I've set something up like Vanish, I then think, okay, now I've got to go take go, what am I doing steps ahead. And the other thing is I always look to the future. So what am I doing down the road? Um, you know, I could have told you ten years ago where Vanish was going to be and what was going to happen. Um, well, I couldn't have told you about the, the pandemic, but I could have told you that this is the steps it's going to take. Um, Performance-wise, um, I've there's no real, there's no real, there's no, there's no as far as chap, there's no other than just doing the show and uh, there's no real big goal with the show. I've done everything. I want to the television. I've done. Um, uh, there's nowhere. I've I just if a gig comes in, I'll take it. I'll do the gig. Um, I think more lectures and things. I really enjoy that. I really. I was a teacher 100 years ago um, I, when I finished my degree in music. I got my um, teaching thing in New Zealand diploma or whatever it is for high school teaching. Um, so I always enjoyed the teaching side of it. So I do get a kick out of that. I really, what I am really excited about for magic in general is this online thing. I know a lot of people hate it, um, but those people will hate anything. Like, you know, people get so set in their ways. I'm a comedy magician. I don't, don't do kids magic, you know. Oh, no, no, they look down upon everything else. And a lot of people are looking down upon the virtual world. Um, or it's, you know, and that's just all it means is it's not for them. I don't look, you don't look down upon it and just say it's not for me and move on. You don't have to make negative comments about it. Um, I think it's exciting because it's, 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 we've developed, I've been in consulting for a lot of people and I've developed stuff that you wouldn't even know <coughs> has my name on uh, hasn't got my name on it <coughs> excuse me um but it's me behind it uh, i've created all this incredible stuff really fun stuff for online things and um i've been busy doing that and uh i'd like to do more of that uh, and i don't need the accolade i don't need my name on anything i'm quite happy just to see someone i get excited i um 
I get excited. You know, I can't say what it, who it was because you'd know it was me. Um, <laughs> but somebody performed something on a really major TV show recently, and and it was something that I helped create, and and I just got the thrill of seeing this done on a huge platform. You know, um, so I really enjoy that side of it. If, if, the, if you hear my son in the background, he's excited because the Minecraft update comes out today. <laughs> so it's, well, I'm it's telling a, you right now, if my son was here and not at school right now and he knew that, he'd be jumping for joy because... We, we, we homeschool, so he's at school and at home and the, oh, Minecraft, uh, the Minecraft update just came out. So uh, <laughs> I guess he's nine o'clock, so I, I'll have to go and start his homeschool. But uh, it's, his noise, it's his excitement in the background. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Awesome. So, so, so coming up, yeah, uh, that's it really. I mean, there's not, I don't know, I always look towards the future. Uh, Vanish, I will take to, I've got taken to different levels. Um, perform, you know, as I said, look, I'm still creating this stuff. Um, I'm never stop thinking. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so I mean, who knows, you know. And where can people buy your stuff? Do you have oh, much? anywhere. No, you know, they can buy it anywhere. I don't, I sort of try not to sell it myself because I don't like going to the post office. Um, <laughs> um, but they can buy it from any magic dealer, pretty much. Your favorite magic dealer will have my line. If they go to murphysmagic.com, I have my own little thing and I, whatever it is, I don't know, little name. And um, they can see all the products and books and stuff on there. And then they can get anything from their local dealer. Here's a question. If people have never seen your material before, and they want to go and buy something and they're searching for you on their local magic dealer, what thing would you advise them to buy to get a good flavor of what your type of magic is that you create? Oh, that's, that's a really hard one because mine covers everything from mentalism close up to, you know, the, probably the best thing is, is that online, I think it's like five bucks or 10 bucks, is the two hour lecture I did for Murphy's, we better finish this, but he's getting rowdy. <laughs> the Nathan, <laughs> the, he's, he's, he's getting rowdy. Huh? I don't know. I said, give him beer this morning. He's fine. Um, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> you can have leftover gin. Um, uh, the Murphy's download, which is like two at hours. Table. At the table. Yeah. yeah, at the table. Yeah, yeah, because it's like nine or ten bucks or five bucks or nine bucks, whatever it is, US uh, dollars. It's like, you know, two pounds. Um, uh, they can, uh, they can some two hours of everything. I think there's a bit of Chaplin in there. There's close up. There's mentalism. There's platform stage. It's, it's a real hodgepodge of everything. That, that's the best thing. Brilliant. And, and then you get it as a download too. Yeah, yeah, you can just literally go on any magic yeah. dealer and it'll go straight into your account. Brilliant stuff. Paul, I'm going to put the uh, links down below for Vanish Magazine. I encourage everybody to subscribe because I love what you're doing with that. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much for being on the channel. You're a very busy person. You've got a family. We can hear that. You know, you've got everything going on with performing and creating and doing the magazine. So thank you so much for finding time for jumping on the channel with me. I really appreciate it. Especially oh, thank you. in the morning. Yeah, that's fine. Well, now it's late. We've been on for six hours. So uh... <laughs> it only felt like 10. So, I mean, that's, that's good. <laughs> that's it's bad time now. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. You're great. Keep up the good work. Thank you will do guys leave a comment down below for paul i'm sure he'll see it um so if you like the interview let him know and like i said please uh check out vanish magazine i am a huge fan it's absolutely amazing um guys don't forget to join me again tomorrow there's going to be three videos going up tomorrow paul thanks very much i'll see you again take care thanks bye, bye. bye.